All right, we're rolling. What's up, Haylin? Hi. Hi. I'm back with three more fantastic questions. I hope okay. you find them fantastic. I hope you brought some whoppers. <laughs> I'll try. I'm going to try. Okay. Um, and as always, you can disagree with my question itself. Okay. Um, you and I probably agree that feeling hunger is a pretty important part uh, of the weight loss process. And most people haven't traditionally felt hunger or a lot of dieters haven't felt hunger. Uh, diets usually talk about not being hungry. Um, why, is, why, is being, point. Yeah. why in your mind is being able to sense and feel hunger uh, and be able to tune into hunger so darn important as part of the weight loss process? Well, um, I mean, I don't think it's realistic to expect that we can lose weight and never feel any hunger, sort of like you probably can't get a higher education degree without ever having to do some work. Like you're, it's just, it's one of the challenges that is associated with a goal. And so, you know, change, change of all types is typically going to have some form of discomfort or work that we, we need to do. So, I mean, the diets that say you can lose all this weight and never feel hungry. I don't know if anybody's ever had that experience. Please write to me if you've had that experience, cause I want to hear about it. Um, uh, I, and I do think there may be some circumstances where people aren't hungry due to pharmaceuticals or medications or, or diet sort of drugs, but I don't think it's generally a realistic thing for most people to expect. So I think it's mostly a, a necessity to understand what's going on when our bodies feel hungry. If that's a scary thing, if it means that we're in danger, if we are doing something wrong, if we get hungry, does it mean I'm going into starvation mode? You know, I think those are um, very legitimate questions. And when you and I teach people that hunger is a totally normal thing, that it's a sensation your body's going to use to tell you about your food intake and if it's needing more or if it's getting too much. Um, and I have found that most people, even if they initially are staunchly in like the I hate hunger camp, are able to change their feelings about it if they have an open mind and they just try experiencing it like a fresh start, like hunger, you and I have an ugly past. We fought a lot. I think I just want to meet you in a neutral <laughs> environment. And let's just see if we can be friends here. Let, let bygones be bygones. And they realize like, okay, on a scale of zero to 10, if 10 is like being eaten alive by a shark, this is not a 10. This is not even an eight. This is like a three most days by the time I get to eat if I get super hungry and I'm caught on the train and I don't get to eat for several hours, it could get into like four or five level distress, but it's not physically excruciating. And so um, we can rule out the physical dangers aspect of it. And then we can talk about why for some people hunger feels psychologically dangerous um, and address that because it, it is not in fact dangerous to a person. So when we can, I mean, it, it's one of the greatest things that we can do for another person is help eliminate their fear of something and help them feel empowered to know what to do with it and how to respond to it. So I do, I think it's a, a great way of equipping people to teach them about their body signals and how they can coexist with them and not feel afraid of them. So uh, agree or disagree, hunger is as natural a body signal as tiredness and having to go pee. 100% agree. Yeah. 100%. Totally shifting gears. So, probably most, uh, at least my experience, maybe yours, like people, if any meal is skipped, it's breakfast. People go decades without ever eating breakfast, not necessarily as a strategy, but just not hungry in the morning, don't have time. Um, so, for those folks who had breakfast in a long period of time, how do you uh, encourage breakfast and how do you sort of get them, uh, what's the easy start to incorporate breakfast into your life? Sure, so people skip breakfast for different reasons. Sometimes they're like physically averse to food in the morning they wake up, they're like, oh God, no, not now. Um, other times people think I could save calories if I don't have breakfast and just like 
delay eating as long as I can into the day before I start eating. So some are doing it deliberately as a way of calorie control. Um, and then some people have been kind of sold the intermittent fasting idea. So they think, let me not eat for the easiest part of the day, which is breakfast. And then I can just do all of my eating in a certain window. So um, the difficulty with all of these situations is that it tends to be correlated with overeating later in the day. And if somebody is having trouble losing weight and they want to reduce their calorie intake, if you take those calories away from breakfast, they tend to appear in larger number in the evenings. So we know that it's, it's evidence-based in research that people who skip breakfast or have fewer calories before noon take in more calories overall over the course of the day because they eat more later. And so we certainly see that also in people who have uh, binge eating disorder or uh, what's called night eating syndrome, where they eat a good proportion of their calories after dinner. They often aren't hungry the next morning, logically, so they don't feel a strong drive to eat and then it just perpetuates itself. So, um, so it does help with appetite control. It also helps with having energy throughout the day for a lot of people to be able to spread their calories more evenly over their waking hours. Um, in terms of how to go about adding breakfast, if you've not been a breakfast eater, there's no real wrong way to do it. I've had people that were like, I don't like breakfast foods. So they would eat like leftover chicken stir fry for breakfast. Nothing wrong with that. Cold pizza, rock on. If you don't like solid food, some people feel like uh, a smoothie or something would go down more easily. Um, I've negotiated with people who are like, no, I absolutely can't. I'll puke if I eat food. Can you eat one bite of banana? Like, <laughs> I, will, I will bargain as low as we can go to get some element of change in there. And for some people, it's literally one bite of fruit is the place they start. And then your body adjusts and it starts to anticipate getting food in the morning and you actually develop a morning appetite. And concurrently, if we can reduce high calorie intake at dinner or in the evening, that also helps your, your body get the circadian rhythm of feeling hungry in the earlier part of the day. So there's no wrong food to add. Um, people can start with whatever they want, but there is a lot of benefit in terms of overall calorie control and weight loss. What about our friends that like to snack a lot and help them out. Um, can you give us two or three strategies that are your two or three most effective strategies in your work with folks um, that help folks minimize snacking and focus on snacking in the nighttime or afternoon and nighttime snacking are the most common, obviously. Sure. Um, so what are a couple of tools in the toolbox that people could put? Well, um, people snack for different reasons. And so if you know the reason why someone's snacking or if you can think of the reason why you're snacking, it becomes easier to find uh, an alternate behavior. So if somebody's hungry, they may need to eat more at meals. So if somebody tries to not snack and they're just plain too hungry, larger meals are gonna be part of the solution for them. If um, they're doing it because they're stressed and they really like the breaks during work or they want the entertainment, like entertainment is one of my favorite things to do if I didn't care about uh, controlling my calorie intake or taking good care of my body. Yeah, I like the idea of eating all the time, but I just know it's not good for me. Um, you can recognize that I'm not actually hungry, but I need to take breaks. And so you can take different breaks. You can take a break for music, take a break to take a walk, take a break to chat with a coworker. Um, so try and meet the need in another way, as opposed to just telling yourself no breaks for you. Um, other times people have associated snacking with another activity, such as television. And they feel like I can't do one of those things without the other. But if you think, why not? There's no real reason you can't. You're just accustomed to that. So if you're used to having, like if somebody was trying to quit smoking and every morning they have coffee and a cigarette and you try to take away the cigarette for a few days, they're gonna be like, this coffee needs its companion here, but that's gonna eventually phase out and the person's gonna be like, I really like my coffee. Um, and the same thing can happen if people are associating evening snacks plus the TV, plus the not working time. It's just this cluster of good time in their mind that if you change the food, it's the same. You could change the amount of food, it's still okay. And you could probably leave the food out of the equation and realize it's still enjoyable to relax and enjoy some entertainment in the evening. So 
Um, so if somebody is not up for stopping the snacking right away, we'll often substitute it and shrink it just to see how somebody feels about that before we do a trial of. Mm, yeah. So eliminating it altogether is not necessarily the best strategy. No, and as you've experienced yourself, some people are game. Some people are like, pedal to the metal. I want to change as many behaviors as quickly as possible. And they're like, yeah, I don't need the snack. I could do without it. And then other people are like, from my cold dead fingers, I'm <laughs> not giving up my snack. So, you know, a good coach will just meet their client where they're at and feel out their readiness and what, what is comfortable to them without being frighteningly difficult. Yeah. Um, and is there also some space to allow some snacking as long as it's accommodated in your other in your meals so like maybe discount the size of your meal a little bit because you know you're going to snack with them absolutely meals and snacks are just eating occasions so you know if somebody's eating three or four times a day call them whatever you want that's a pretty ideal frequency that should enable you to get um hungry before eating and eat satisfied and get hungry again so you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with eating four times um, and there's nothing wrong with eating three times. If somebody wants to start adding in more eating occasions than that, it tends to be difficult because you're not hungry for one of them or you're not eating dissatisfied at one of them. And both of those are kind of not ideal. Um, so there's also the case for exceptions. Like, so as a rule, I try not to eat between meals. I try to eat my meals and have spaces between them. And I make exceptions when I travel because I get exceptionally anxious and exceptionally motion sick. So I will usually plan to eat dry carby things for as much of the plane flight as I possibly can. <laughs> so I will like take a bag of multigrain Cheerios and like eat one Cheerio at a time for like three hours in a row because I'm just doing what I have to do to get through the plane flight. Um, and I usually figure I'm going to eat enough like pretzels and Cheerios over the course of a travel day. I don't need to include too many carbs with my meals. So I focus on getting some vegetables and getting some protein. And I just let myself snack for that day. And I don't worry about it because something we do infrequently, like I generally say something you do less than once a month is highly unlikely to cause a significant impact on your health or your body composition. So yeah, if there's certain circumstances where it just feels really, really difficult to break up with the snacking habit, you may choose to keep it and just moderate the portion or think about what you can choose that feels like um, damage control. Like you know, eating Cheerios for a couple of hours is going to be less excess energy and sugar than if I ate M&Ms for two hours or you know, what else you could think of. So um, yeah, there is something to be said for some, some of my clients do keep a snack on hand for special circumstances and it's, it's not the end of the world. That was awesome. I hope folks find that helpful. I hope so too. Thanks. You crushed it as always. <laughs>